Okay, so in the previous video we set up our store procedure. Uh, it's called Archive History. It's done in the production schema. Uh, we're working with, of course, the AdventureWorks 2008 database. And again, this is SQL 2008 full version. Whenever that comes up. There we go. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and run this then. Uh, again, picking up from the previous video, in case you're just watching this one by itself, we've got a store procedure that takes two arguments for a start and end date, and what it does is it takes the uh, transactions from what it is the transaction history table, okay, see it from down here, and delimited by the dates, it archives them over into the transaction history archive table. Okay, uh, we're nowhere near done. We've got a few more things to throw in. We've got some issues to handle. But first, let's go ahead and give this a try to make sure that the data gets pulled. Uh, we looked at this previously and seen that the oldest month in the uh, transaction history table was September 2003. And so we're going to archive that month based on the delimited dates right here. So first off, let's go ahead and pull up those two tables so that uh, after we fire this off, we can see that the data has been moved. And then it's time to handle uh, a couple other issues with transactions uh, and rollback and also uh, notification if there's a problem. Uh, both of those have to be handled before this could be used. So let's go in and first give it a try as it is in its raw state before we get all the extra things on it. Uh, this is in production, we said, right? So let's get this over so we can see a little better. And we said that this was the transaction history. There we go. Get that to scoot over a little more. Okay, so we'll need to have a look in this guy. And a look in this one. Okay. Take top thousand off. Run this one. And run. Take top thousand off this guy. Run this one. Okay. Now, if you had a lot of data, of course, best practices would be to just put an order by clause in here. Um. Let's see, modify date, and we would want that to be ascending to see the earliest possible. Okay, actually this would be descending for this one, and ascending for the other. And let's just go ahead and borrow this. Since they both have the same schema, really won't matter. Down to the bottom row. All right, so we just concatenate it on the end. That, that'll work fine. And so when we run this, we see, let's see, Adventure Transaction History. So we want to see the oldest, not the newest. Okay, oh, which we are with, that's 2004. We want to see 2003. So, Ascending. There we go. September 2003. Okay. This is where it's coming from. And just to make sure we don't get confused. No, we'll be fine. We'll be fine there. Okay. And descending. And we can see that. Right, and we'll need to see. What the, okay, so there we go. The newest in the archive is um, August 2003. Here in this one, it's September 2003. So let's go ahead and move it across. 
with our stored procedure. And I'll show you that in a minute. Okay. To do that, we need to have an exec call to run this stored procedure. Um, I could type it all out, but since we're on limited time, let's go ahead and choose to execute, and it'll create a little script for us. And I can show you the parts of that quickly in just a moment. We said we wanted to do just September, so the start date will be 2003-09-01. And we'll just copy that guy down. Make sure this is the 30th. Okay. And here we go. Now, we didn't return a value, so of course the return value is going to be zero. And again, the money drop here is going to be, does it show? This is the archive table. And so let's run. And September 2003 is here. It wasn't there before. It was 8, 2003. Now it's 9. It's there. So it worked. Okay, so we can move on to the next parts of what we need to do for our actual stored procedure, which you're getting a little unintentional preview there of. Let's pull it up. Okay, that's our script. Where's... We need to close some of these extra windows. It can be a little much. No, I don't want to save it. Let me the next one over. Here it is. Now, all right, here's what we need to do now. I said that we need to add some transactions, and we need to add some error notification recovery. Um, it's best to add the error recovery first. Um, that will help drive our transactions because we don't want to do a rollback if we don't have a problem. So we have to figure out if we have a problem first. So we'll start with our try block here. We'll go down here and we'll end it. And then, of course, it's complaining because we don't have our catch block yet. So if we get that in place, that's going to be... Okay, now, try catch, just as with uh, programming in uh, C-sharp or any other language, uh, object-oriented language that supports try catch blocks, of course, uh, this block will, if there's any exception thrown, it will go down to the catch block. And so that's key because if there's any issue, like the row already exists, in the table and it can't insert it uh, based on the primary key throwing an error or some other sort of error maybe the database is down or connections down or something we need to run a rollback okay so then we know in that case we need one but for that to happen we need a transaction so now when it comes to transactions um, that of course is a segment where you're doing usually some change query or something of that sort and uh, maybe you're declaring an object it'll be data manipulation or definition language of some sort but the point is that um, you're doing something that either can't be done twice or cannot afford some sort of an error just read queries don't have this sort of problem but the point is with the transaction we need to be able to roll that back before we cause a problem because database corruption is one of the worst things that can happen to you when you're running an application that needs to be reliable. So, how do we do that? Well, we do a transaction. Okay. And now for best practice sake, we really should do some indentation so that we can easily distinguish what's going on here. And this should go in a little bit. Okay. Now, transactions don't have to be named. Okay. 
Um, many of them are just synonymous with no name, although you can give them a name like this. Uh, in our particular case, that's not going to be necessary. Uh, we'll only need one transaction because <clears throat> right now we're just doing one change. So uh, the important thing is that we understand how this try-catch block works. That's really going to drive what's going on and uh, how we need to respond to it. So remember with the try-catch block, it will run whatever uh, query or code is in here. And if there's any problem, it'll immediately hit the catch block. Okay, And that's the key, is that we can then put the uh, commit down here at the bottom with no issue because it will not finish the block of code once it finds there's a problem. So okay, so we can do that. Okay, and we can then down here in the catch block, this says there's a problem here, right? So let's keep these in line as closely as we can. Just like that. All right, and with F5, it's added in because this is an alter statement. Now, <clears throat> so the point is if there's any issue here, we should get an automatic rollback. Now, one other thing should happen. Um, we want to do some notification. Okay, so uh, if there is a problem, we would like to know what it was. And there's two ways to do this um, when it comes to the notification part. Um, way one, number one, is to add a parameter up here that would be an output parameter. Like this, and we'll make it pretty big, and it's going to be output type. Okay, and so with an output type here, or we could just call it out, you'll see both. Okay, either way, um, this then can be captured by scripts or an application that's looking for an error message. The catch is that we have to assign what that is. Okay, so down here we would say error message. Okay. And of course, we can set this by using the set or select. Either way, I'll go ahead and use set this time. Now, there are some functions for this. In doing this, you see there are some specific methods that are set up just for the catch block. They don't work anywhere else. The one we're going to use is called error message. Now, if you wanted to get fancy with this, you could do this as long as the uh, variable is big enough. I give a thousand characters for this. You don't want to go too big, of course, but sometimes for your programming, you'll want to 